Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Todd Stocky. I am a, a Senior Vice President and Editorial Director at Sourcebooks. We are a book publisher uh, headquartered in the Chicago area, and we happen to publish um, some of the best-selling uh, college reference books in the country. And we are proud today to be bringing you uh, three of our authors, and um, uh, we will be uh, uh, speaking with, uh, with Ethan Sawyer, Harlan Cohen, and Ted Fisk today. Um, and we'll have an opportunity at the end as well to um, have some breakout rooms where folks will get to you as participants will get to choose uh, uh, to go into a breakout room and we'll do a little bit of extra Q&A with individual uh, folks there. Um, uh, thank you for joining us virtually. Um, we, we, we miss the in-person of, um, of the NACAC conference and conferences, um, and we, 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 we miss seeing you all. Uh, but um, uh, we'll dive in today. Um, and I uh, want to tell you a couple quick housekeeping things. We have a, a quick poll up here asking um, who you are, student, counselor, parent, or other. Uh, if you could help us out with that, that helps us a lot to know who's in the room. Um, and, uh, and the Q&A function is, is open. So um, if you have um, uh, questions, uh, we encourage you to use the, 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 the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, should be at the bottom of your screen. It is for me. Um, and um, with that said, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our, first, uh, our first author, Ethan Sawyer. Uh, Ethan is um, uh, known as the college essay guy. Uh, and he is the author of College Essay Essentials and College Admission Essentials um, and all around every person, uh, my friend Ethan. So take it away, Ethan. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Hi, friends. I imagine there are a lot of friends out there, though I can't see you all. I wish I could. I wish I could hug you. If you weren't in a pandemic, I probably would. Um, but um, I'd love to, if we could, Caitlin, if we could end the poll so I could just see what the breakdown is of folks who are here. I'm, I'm imagining we've got a bunch of counselors. But I'd love to see. Let's see. We've got indeed 82% counselors, so we're mostly counselors. We've got 20 parents and six intrepid students. Well, welcome, welcome all. So if you really knew me, you'd know I'm a resources guy, and part of that is, I don't know. I could go into why that is, but I think it's it's the relevant part of this is like I feel like we're in season. Like this is we're coming into early deadlines. So with my 15 minutes, my my sort of mini TED talk is going to be sharing with you some resources that I think will be useful for you, whether you're a counselor, 82% of you are, a student or a parent, um, or you are apparently a parent. And um, I'm hoping that I'm gonna be sharing some things. Even those of you who know my resources will find something new and useful. So if you want to, feel free to share in the chat box what brings you here today, and we'll try to, we'll try to meet all the needs. Uh, so I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Oh, could I, would you, Caitlin, would you mind giving me sharing screen privileges? if you please, that would be so awesome. So the first resource that I wanna share with y'all is one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and working on this past, really the past nine months is uh, the YouTubes. <laughs> so on YouTube, I've been putting together a, a new video, pretty much releasing a new video once or twice a week. And this is gonna seem super overwhelming here at the start, but if you're interested in more like video resources that if you're a counselor, you can share with your students, um, you'll see things like, for example, why this college do's and don'ts. So this is like how to write an awesome why us essay. And I've got a new editor that I'm really excited. His name is Vlad. I've been working with him and he's been doing lots of fun stuff with the videos. So this is, for example, a 20 minute crash course. And I know 20 minutes doesn't sound like a crash course in the why us essay. But if you're a counselor who spends a lot of time talking to students about the Why Us essay. This was a pretty good recap of some of the things that students need to be thinking of. You'll also see, you know, past webinars that I've done with, you know, for example, students who are Match Lighters students. Uh, Match Lighters is the program that some of you know about that pairs volunteer counselors with students uh, on a one-to-one -one basis for free uh, essay help. So you'll see stuff on that. And then all kinds of short videos like what is the Common App and how do students know if their essay is doing its job, et cetera. So, Go to the, you go to the College Essay Guy, you know, YouTube page and click subscribe. You don't see that button here because I'm on the internal view and um, you'll get a video a week. So that's a thing. Um, and then the second one is, I don't know if you caught this the first time around. We sent this out on our email list, but essentially we put together, you know, this, I was talking to a friend at a charter school. And one of the things she was saying is that she would love to email her students on a monthly basis or 
whenever, but she's overwhelmed. And so I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool if we just put together like email templates for busy counselors? And so the way this works, if you click in this templates folder, you'll see a Google Drive and we're in, it's late September. Let's say that it's early October and you're trying to figure out what should I send to my students? So you click in here and there are different folders, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. Let's say you wanna figure out what, am I, what should I be sending to my juniors in uh, October? You click this and here's basically, here are resources that you can copy and paste. And you just take these and you add your own intro and boom, you email it out to your students. And if you're one of those counselors, though few are, that you email all students at once, we've got a version of this here that allows you to just copy and paste. And you can, you know, use whichever reason. This would be overwhelming, I think, for students. But you can basically pick and choose from those. And so this is for, especially for those counselors who don't already have sort of like a set, you know, here are the things that I email my students at every month. Uh, we put it together here for you. So this was a labor of love for my team. I did not do this on my own. So shout out to my, my team at College Essay Guy for helping put this together. But if you're a counselor who looks through these and you're like, oh, I see a resource that's missing that, that, you know, that I think should be here, we'd love for you to email us and let us know. You can email help at collegeessayguy.com. And please share this with, with counselors that you feel like could use this. Uh, we wanna spread the word. Another resource that we put together recently is we found that there were certain things that weren't out there for international students. Uh, resources, for example, in understanding what are, for example, some of those common mistakes that international students make when they're applying to college. Things that you can probably assume, you know, only applying to schools in the US or only applying to highly selective schools in the US. And so this blog sort of hopes, you know, to sort of tackle some of those problems. And then there's, all kinds of things like a checklist for international students when they're applying to the US. We answer questions like, do I need to take an English proficiency exam? You know, should I complete a foundation program? So this is sort of like what we're calling our international hub for international students. And you know, there are all sorts of things like how to research universities outside of the US or how to research colleges without visiting a campus. So as you can see, oh, there's a, there's a big one, step-by-step uh, -step financial aid guide for international students. This was put together, shout out to Tiffany Knight and Emily Dobson, a hugely comprehensive guide on how to think about financial aid for, for international students, because there are a lot of particular considerations. And then here's one of my favorites, schools that are actually cheap, affordable options under $10,000. Um, so you'll see in here some other you know, brainstorming stuff that will apply to a lot, of, a lot of students. You'll see a guide to like the UCAS personal statement. So I'm not gonna go through all these because it would break your brain. Um, related to this, this is a really exciting one. And by the way, these links are all popping up in the chat. Liz, thank you for sharing these in the chat. Related to this, I was contacted by a student named Vikyat a few months ago, and he's an international student. He's navigating the process right now for himself. And one of the things that he was having trouble figuring out is which schools offer how much money to international students. And so he, enterprising human that he is, was able to scrape the data from College Board's Big Future site and the Institutional Financial Aid for International Students data sheet and common data set to basically pull a ton of data. And he shared with me these impressive spreadsheets. And I was like, OMG, these are awesome. What could this become? And I shared it with a couple of colleagues. And one of them said, hey, I know a match letter student who's really good at developing websites. Maybe he would be interested in getting involved. And so we can, and his name was Sammy. So we connected VQ out with Sammy. And over the past few months, they created this really cool resource that basically is a sortable spreadsheet. It basically takes all that data and allows students to type in things like, you know, they can search for the percentage, you know, the number of international undergraduates awarded. So they can type in their a range here and it'll sort this whole spreadsheet based on this. Now, if you're a counselor who's like, oh my gosh, I am so excited to potentially use this with my students. I'd love to get more into it. I'd love for you to take it, check it, take the link, check it out, use it this year, see how it's going with students, and then tell us how you're finding this to be useful because we feel like there's another iteration or six that are possible with this, but we need to figure out how to use this with students. So we're reaching out to you, our community, to figure that out. And I will share with you, because I don't have the link handy just at the moment, right after I'm done, um, with, I'll share with you a quick guide to, uh, a quick form that you can fill out if you're interested in becoming part of the team that's assembling, kind of we're assembling some Avengers to figure out how could we make a resource that would be useful globally for students internationally or applying to the US. 
So I'll share that form when I'm done here in about three minutes. Another link, just to overwhelm you with all the links, is this college application hub. And if you've been on my website before or you've been on my email list, you see me share this, but this is sort of like, this is the hub for domestic students. And this is where I keep pretty much all the things that we put together. And of course, at the top, we link the international student hub right here. Um, so you can click over to the, the, the third link that I shared. But this has got pretty much all the things that kind of walk students through this process. Um, and it's, it's kind of like my go-to one when students are like, I have a question about, I'm like, wait, check here. <laughs> Cause the answer probably is here. Um, assembled with so many different you know, resources over the past, you know, five or six years. So that's one that I just want to flag for you if you haven't seen that yet. A couple things that are coming down the pipe, but you, you can't, I'm not sharing links to these just yet. Uh, in fact, oh, it's going to mess up and share links to this. These aren't public yet. So those 249 of you who are on this, you can go here, I suppose, if you copy the link, but, but hang tight. Um, and I'll tell you when you can check these out. But this is a public and charter school counselors hub. And so these are resources that are specifically for public and charter school counselors. And this is going to be organized based on, you know, how to set up your office and pretty much all of these things here, how to engage families, resources on testing, uh, ready to go templates, uh, flyer templates on Canva, et cetera. So a whole bunch of stuff. We want this to feel like a home for public and charter school counselors. This is getting revealed really soon, but I just wanted to kind of, this is really like a first peek at this. And then the second thing is something called Paying for College in Four Steps. This is a resource that Amanda Miller and another awesome, a larger group of counselors have been putting together called Paying for College in Four Steps. So another one that's forthcoming that we'll be sharing really, really soon. If you wanna be the first to hear about these, if you're not already subscribed to my email or my email or my newsletter, if you just go to collegeessayguy.com, which is like my homepage, and you scroll down to the very bottom here, and you just type in your email address and pick, you know, I'm a counselor, I'm a student, I'm a parent, and you subscribe. We're going to be re releasing these probably in the next couple of weeks, and you'll get a heads up about that. And I think that's it. Did I, is that my time, Liz? Did I come in okay? No, you're doing great. We actually just have a, a question, so oh, I yes. wanted to pop in with that. Um, do you have any specific resources to guide students on how to create essay outlines? Ooh, absolutely. So I'm going to go to my college application hub here. And so here's, there are two that I would point you to. So I'm scrolling down to where it says personal statement. And so if you see this personal statement one, college application hub, you'll see here how to write a college essay step-by-step, -step, the ultimate guide. I feel like there should be an echo there, the ultimate guide. Um, and then if you go in there, you'll see a, like a whole walkthrough of that. You'll see obviously in here, some stuff like start how to start your essay and then how to revise. But in terms of outlining, you'll find it mostly in there. After Harlan presents and Ted presents, I'll have, we'll have a breakout room and we can jam out, nerd out on essays in the Q&A. But for now, I will kick it over to you, Liz. All right. Thanks so much, Ethan. All right, we're on to our uh, next panelist. Um, you probably know him best as the author of the uh, New York Times bestselling Going to College Guide, The Naked Roommate, but Harlan Cohen has dedicated his career to helping students and parents and professionals dream big and navigate change and lead with confidence and clarity. He's also recently become a bit of a TikTok sensation. He's sharing um, college tips that are being viewed by millions, so do check those out later. Um, but for now, it is my pleasure to introduce Harlan Cohen. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I am so grateful to have the opportunity to share with you uh, another resource. And I should also mention, Ethan, I love your generosity. I love the resources you put together, your passion. I mean, like, I didn't know you were doing all those things. And I'm like, wowed and so excited to share these resources with everyone, because I think what you do is, is just remarkable and incredible, and Ted as well, and also Sourcebooks, a uh, wonderful partner. I am grateful to share with you a new book. Uh, this is a book that wasn't available last NACAC, and it's now available. It's Win or Learn, The Naked Truth to Turning Every Rejection into Your Ultimate Success. And if you're familiar with Naked Roommate, it's all about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable and navigating change. But this is a book that is, has pictures, it's double spaced, it's very easy to read. And it's really about mindset, adopting a growth mindset and being able to apply a very simple formula to approaching 
change, a lot of you helping students to deal with the change, the transition to college, but I'll spoil what I'm going to share with you, but it, the steps are pretty simple. It's what do you want? You got to define something you want, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, think people, places, and patients, tell your story as if it's already happened, and then celebrate, reflect, and repeat. And what this book does is it distills really the, the, the marrow of what makes Naked Roommates so powerful and gives you a wonderful framework. This whole growth mindset of I never lose, I either win or I learn. This idea that if you could take a risk and know no matter what, you'd be okay, would it be so risky? Would it be so hard? The struggle of, am I gonna get into the best college? Will I get into this school? What will my future look like? But the thing is your future is gonna be okay no matter what, because you're gonna be okay no matter what. School is not the thing that's gonna determine your future. You are the one. And really instilling this belief of worthiness, uh, of students feeling a sense of, of self. Uh, I am very vulnerable in the book and in the videos I've been putting out there recently. Uh, one of the things that's been really hard for me is to feel good about myself, is to know that I'm worthy and deserving. Uh, I struggled a lot, I still struggle with, uh, my weight and body image. I have a wonderful therapist and I'm proud to talk about therapy and I'm proud to, proud to talk about my journey. Uh, even though physically I changed, uh, I still struggled. And so many students are struggling, especially given COVID. So many students internalize all, all, so, so much pain. And this year is a difficult year. And it's a year to remind students that you are worthy and deserving of anything you want. Your birthright is to live your life of a dream. You know, what is it that you dream of? And so many students don't see this, especially our underserved, underrepresented populations. And what I'm able to do is to help them to see you are worthy. I want to just take a moment. And in the chat, I would love to know what your dream is. Uh, I've been doing wonderful interviews and conversations, and I'll share more about that with you. But I've been talking to people who are later on in their careers, who are deep in their careers. And one of the things I've learned is we never stop dreaming. And it's really powerful and wonderful to share your dreams. And I would love to know in the chat what your dream is. And I'll be glancing over and I'd love to incorporate that into some of what I share during my time. But you, your dreams, what you want is very important. In fact, I think more important than even the dreams of those who you're serving, because unless you're living a life that's in alignment with the things you want and going after things that excite you, it's gonna be hard for you to be present and hard for you to be able to serve those around you. I'm gonna get into your dreams, but I want you to know some of the resources. Uh, when it comes to helping students to live their dreams, when it comes to helping your families to understand that what they want is accessible, understanding that it's not just those highly selective schools that create a dream life, that school is less important to the dream. What's more important is what you're gonna do there. Uh, Denise Pope, I uh, had a wonderful chance to visit with her. I've been uh, interviewing uh, influencers and, and thought leaders and trying to get the, their messages out to the world through Before College TV. This is a, a quick snippet of my conversation with Denise. So true or false, where you go to college is the number one determining factor when it comes to student success and satisfaction. Is that true or false? False, 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 false. False. False, false. So everybody watching this, I want this to you to be crystal clear. Where you go to college is not the number one determining factor. Not where you go, it's what you do there. So that let's like that I can shout from the rooftops. I can say unequivocally, you can make it as dramatic as you want. It's 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 we have the data to back this. So that is really powerful. And to hear it from Denise, Challenge Success, a wonderful program reinforces this idea. And what's wonderful about Ethan and, and with Ted is that no matter where you go, if you know what you want, then you're going to be successful. And you can also change what you want. I continue to change. I teach. I listen. I grow. Uh, I tell people stories. And I'm finding ways to share these stories so you could reinforce this message and share your stories. Uh, I'm going super fast today just because of my time allotment. Uh, this is my family. Uh, these are my kids. I, I have uh, three, three boys. My oldest is 15. And then I have a 13 year old and I have an eight year old. And uh, then my wife, Stephanie is a speech pathologist. And our goal is to help people get comfortable with the uncomfortable so they can navigate all these changes. 
the changes that students go through, social, emotional, physical, financial, and academic. One of the biggest challenges that we face during COVID is so many students lost their places, uh, they lost their people, they became impatient, and they're struggling with these areas. What's wonderful as a counselor is looking at COVID and helping students to have perspective and identifying which of these areas did you struggle with? How are you able to get that help? How are you able to find the things that give you joy? And how can you apply that to your college experience? I'm giving you all these slides. I have a link. You can go through all this, uh, all the slides. We can also communicate in our breakout session. We can also talk beyond that. Uh, I love jumping on the phone with counselors and I love sharing these messages. I want to let you know that these, let's see, what did you ask me? Oh, sorry, I'm trying to multitask. And one of the things about sharing the dreams uh, is I love when you put your dreams in here because sometimes your dreams are the dreams that somebody else is living. And when you take the moment and include your dream in the chat and somebody else sees it in the chat, they might be someone who's already doing what you want. They might, do, they might be someone who wants to help you to get where you wanna go. Uh, and I love seeing this and hopefully I'll get to review these dreams later because there may be more resources that we have to help support you along the way. I wanna break down just a few of the chapters from Win or Learn and you can kind of see what the book looks like in this image. This idea of what do you want? It's such a simple question, but it's a question so many people struggle with and so many students struggle to answer, especially when they're in your office or you're having that consultation, uh, they're scared. And one of the reasons they're scared is because they're afraid they're not gonna get what they want. When you want, there will be one of three outcomes. You will not get what you want, which is the rejection, the pain, the fear, the humiliation. The other outcome is that you're gonna get what you want. And that's great until you start to feel like you're not good enough or you start to have self-doubt or you become envious. The third is you'll get what you want and then you'll lose it. Graduation, retirement, loss, breakups, COVID. We lost all of these things. So what if you lived in a world where you could want and be equipped to handle all three outcomes, where you could be okay not getting it, you could be okay getting it and you could be okay getting it and losing it because nothing is permanent. So freeing students up to want is a gift. Now, the problem is so many students can't want because they haven't wanted for themselves or don't know how to want, or they're not feeling good enough to want. So we have to start with getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. I liked in the book to use want, wanting as the first step because it really gets people thinking because if they can't want, then that's okay because everything's okay. You have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And if you're familiar with me, I've been talking about this for you know, 15, 20 years, and we see it becoming much more common, getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. The 90-10 rule, life's 90% amazing, 10% a bunch of BS. We dealt with a lot of BS this past year. If we live to be 100 years, we could have 10 years of BS. The problem is fighting the BS. The gift of the past year is no matter what community your students are from, they faced a lot of discomfort. And they didn't always know how to work through it. And a lot of them internalized it. And a lot of them felt not good enough because so many of them are unaware of this truth of nature, the universal rejection truth. The universal rejection truth says not everyone and everything's could always respond to me the way I want. And this truth is so powerful because once you can embrace this truth, it is a doorway. It is a gateway to a growth mindset. Because once you understand that there's this truth that's beyond you, you can give yourself permission to be imperfect and to still be exceptional because the most qualified, very best people who do everything right face rejection. And not everybody always agrees with them. Galileo is a great example. You've got tweets from these high achievers who are incredible, who are doing amazing things. One of the reasons that rejection is so painful and students are so risk averse is because physiologically, our brains process rejection the same way it processes physical pain. Helping them to understand this universal rejection truth, helping them to understand that if they're uncomfortable, it's not a sign of them being flawed or imperfect. It's a sign of them being human. And all they have to do is train and build the grit and resilience and practice so that they can handle taking risks and going after what they want. Rejection denial is a dark, dangerous place where everybody thinks everyone and everything should respond the way they want. But the thing is, there's this truth that says it's not always going to happen the way you want. Once you can embrace this, a growth mindset becomes such an easy thing to adopt because being imperfect and not getting it right 
is part of being a human being because there's this truth. So I'm so excited because this book works so beautifully with growth mindset. And what it does is it helps students to reflect when they don't get what they want, when they don't get called on, helps them to tolerate the constant IV drip of pain and rejection that's part of living our lives 24 seven, being exposed to other people and other things. They can stop fighting the truth and hating, hiding, attacking. They can face the truth. And when they don't get what they want, they can say, is it me, is it someone else or is it the universal rejection truth? Not every student's gonna get into that top choice school, but if every student could have three schools that are schools where they have their people and places where they know that they can find the things they want, and there are plenty of those, they're going to win no matter what. I celebrate my rejections. I love celebrating them because it makes me normal. I love celebrating other people's rejections. And then I love connecting people to resources. In Win or Learn, my newest book, we also share people, places, and patients. Step three is find your people, places, and patients. Who are your people? Where are your places? How long will it take to get where you want to go? I'm going laser beam fast. And I see in the, in the um, chat, the universal rejection truth is the URT. I know my time is coming to a close and I built this with so much excitement and so much more because this, this book and this approach is so wonderfully simple and it's so empowering because it will enable you to support your students. When it comes to illustrating the stories, when it comes to proving how you find your people in places, I've been working to interview students during COVID. I've interviewed hundreds of students and I launched a new channel called Before College TV. And on this channel, I have interviews with students sharing their journeys, how they found their people in places and how they got to where they are today. Step four, tell your story as if it happened. It's a wonderful way of leapfrogging the fear and anxiety. You're able to get to the happy ending. There's a template that I've included in the resources, a template that you can use with your students, have them go to the end of the year. I had the most incredible year. I reached my goal and accomplished fill in the blank. I found my people here. I found my places here. We could even tell the story of their week. If they're having a difficult time dealing with their week, you have a template for this. You can also see the template that's in the book. And finally, celebrate, reflect, and repeat. Celebrate that you took a risk. Reflect if it goes the way you wanted, great. If not, that's great too. And then repeat the process till you get where you want to go. This framework, what do you want? What makes you uncomfortable? People, places, patience, tell your story, celebrate, reflect, and repeat. It is such a beautiful way of helping students to alleviate the stress and anxiety and fear, to be able to focus on what they want as opposed to being wanted and align with, with hope and be excited about the future. My TikToks have been become, you know, they've been blowing up. And the reason they're blowing up is because, uh, I, I, I've been helping people to just see what's normal and uncomfortable. And uh, it's been pretty crazy. And I'm pretty excited about that. These videos you could share with your students as well. You could share them with your community. It's in their language. And people rip on me. It's beautiful. They reject me. They don't like me. They love me. Someone was so mean. They said, why should I take advice from a 60-year-old man? Right? No offense to 60-year-old men, but I'm not 60 yet. And I said, I'm like a professor um, and I'm not qu quite at 60, but I leave all the comments because I want people to know that life's uncomfortable. It's challenging. It's difficult. But if you are focused on the message and you surround yourself with the right people and put yourself in the right places, uh, everything's within reach. Uh, before college TV, you could see these interviews. You could check out the one of your people project where I've been interviewing hundreds of students, working with high schools, working with alum. I, I, don't, I wish I had more time to share with you because it's been the most magical year of really connecting and, and shining a light and finding ways to make this something, uh, to, to make this message something that, that can really help in the most profound way. Uh, you can also stay connected with me. Here's all my social media. And uh, also I wanna share one last link. And I know Liz, you shared this as well. Uh, if I get my big head out of the way, if you go to harlancone.com, NACAC-2021, uh, you'll see a bunch of links. One of them is a link to Liz, to Liz Kelsch, the amazing Liz Kelsch, who uh, has been my partner in crime for, oh, Liz, so long. And she can get you an ebook. 
And if you enjoy the ebook, you could actually get the book. Uh, people are using this with Naked Roommate. They're using it in their first year experience classes. They're using it in their homerooms. Uh, it's a wonderful book to get students to ask questions so that then they can find the amazing Ethan and Ted and find the people and places and resources to help them to uh, live their dreams. Uh, thank you for sharing your dreams in here. I wanna save these and address these. Uh, thank you all. I think that's my time, Liz. I think I even went over a little bit. Can't tell. Did I bring it out? Did I go over? <laughs> You're right on time, Harlan. Thank you. I know oh. Ethan wanted to jump in and join you for just a second. Yeah, I just, I wanted to share a dream that I have, Harlan, and I wanted to share a call to action with folks um, related to that dream. So um, one of the things that I've been, uh, that's been on my heart and in my head for the last, whatever, 10 years since I started thinking about this and doing it, I guess 15 years is access and equity and figuring out what are some ways that we can practically help, uh, you know, uh, students who may not have access to resources or who may not be able to afford you know, folks to help them through this process. And one of the ways that we've been doing that has been through this Match Lighters program, which is the program that I mentioned, which pairs volunteer counselors with students on a one-to-one -one basis. And um, the thing that's happening for us right now is one of my dream, when I, I was getting ready to type it in the chat box and I figured I would just say it, my dream is to create an essay review platform where for every uh, paying review that someone submits, we are able to give an essay review to a student for free. So, you know, basically low income students could come into this platform and get free essay reviews. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with a room full of folks that's 82% counselors is that I would love some help with that. And so if there are counselors out there, and, I, and the reason I wanted to speak to it is I saw a bunch of folks popping up saying, I wanna help underserved students. Like, great, have I got a job for you? <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share in the chat a little link to, um, to a, a simple application that'll take you two minutes to complete. And if you're interested in potentially being an essay reviewer, on this platform and working with low income students, I would love to connect with you. And you can send your info through that. And it's a really simple just name, email, what is your experience in this field? And, you know, essentially, here, let me just show you how simple the form is. It's this simple. And we'll get back to you really soon, you know, and this can be as soon as helping students this season. So this is a, a part something that I'm super committed to. And I'd love to connect with you, our community more on this, if you're interested in helping underserved students with their college essays. So feel free to apply and I'll get back to you really soon. You know, and can I just add one thing to that? Cause I didn't share, thank you, Ethan. I love your dreams. I love supporting your <laughs> dreams. I think you're just a beautiful person and you do so much wonderful work. And you know, that's what source books is. And I'm really grateful for that. My dream is to have, is to create a community where any student, no matter where they are, can find someone who looks like them, who has had a similar experience like them and is living a dream that they wanna live. And I call it the one of your people project. And I've included this link in here as well. And uh, basically the one of your people project has been my work where I'm working with gear up students and working with underrepresented populations, first generation students. And um, I'm creating this wonderful catalog where you can, you can see students where they're from, their experiences, and it's just awesome. And I'm working with so many organizations and. Uh, I just want every kid to live their dream and have access to it. So um, I appreciate it. And if anyone's interested in what I've been sharing, we can definitely chat more. Uh, so thanks. And thanks, Ethan and, and Ted and the rest of the team. Okay. Well, um, um, I'm going to uh, move us into the next portion here with Ted Fisk. Um, and uh, before I, 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 I do that, I'd like to kind of double down on this dreams conversation that we're having. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a book publisher. We make books for a living, um, which is a good gig, by the way. Uh, it's fun to make books for a living. Um, and um, our mission is, uh, and our motto is books change lives. Um, and, uh, and I thank you all for contributing in the chat here because it really it reminds us of, it reminds me of, of, of why I loved coming to the NACAC show, uh, a conference every, every, every fall, because, uh, because you folks inspire us to do the best work that we can on behalf of you and on behalf of, 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 all, of all students. And, uh, and we thank you for that. Um, so uh, I would like, uh, without further ado, to bring in Ted Fisk. Um, uh, Ted, uh, Ted and I have been working together for 20-ish years or so. Um, Ted yeah, is the least, uh, least. Creator, creator of the Fisk Guide to Colleges. And uh, we're on our 38th edition overall. 
Um, and, uh, and when, yeah, we're 20 plus years, uh, working together on the Fisk guide and the other, uh, 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 uh Ted Fisk, uh, the other Fisk guide books, uh, that are available as well. But the, the cornerstone, uh, remains the, the, the legendary Fisk guide and it's bright green spine that I can see on a whole shelf behind you there, Ted. Yeah. Um, uh, t tell us about, uh, uh, about how the Fisk guide got started. Yeah, well, you know, first of all, it, it's always a pleasure being with with Harlan and Ethan and all the rest of the team at Sourcebooks. It's really a, an incredible group of creative people who really uh, with really good values. And so, I it's been a it's been a great trip, and, it, and it's going to continue to be that. Uh, the Fisk guy got started way back in the Jurassic period. It was after in the early '80s, after the uh, last of the baby boomers had were, were going through college and. Number of high school graduates was declining, and some colleges, especially second and third tier colleges, were getting a little nervous about whether they could fill their classes. Uh, and so they started getting uh, it very innovative in their marketing, and it made for some great stories. Uh, I remember the uh, there was a school out in Indiana, I think it was, which was very very flat. And one day there was a huge rainstorm and an enormous puddle. Uh, appeared in the middle of the campus. So an alert photographer from the campus uh, PR office recruited a couple of students to go sit on the edge of the puddle. And he took a picture and then they used the picture in the view book the next year, making it look like there was a puddle or a, a lake in the middle of, uh, of, of the campus. And one of the things they didn't notice though, is that the, the, the kids, the students they'd recruited were smoking joints. <laughs> and the uh, the picture ran in their view book, and none of the administrators noticed the joint, but one could presume that a lot of college-bound students probably did. It, it could have led to perhaps a bumper year and applications for that school. I, I, I never found out. But anyway, there was this, uh, there was all of this flurry of publicity and, and different marketing techniques and in retrospect, it's kind of quaint. It was videos and four color brochures filling uh, uh, mailboxes. Uh, but we figured that I was then the edit, education editor of the New York Times, and we figured that somebody had to come in on the side of the consumer. And so that's how the Fisk Guide was, was born. It, it started out as a New York Times selective guide to colleges. But I was saying things in the guide that that I couldn't really say in the newspaper where everything is sort of on the one hand on, on the other. So eventually it transmogrified into the Fisk Guide to Colleges. And so it's, it's been a great journey. So I think um, uh, we are nearly 40 years into, into this, uh, this mission with the guide. Uh, what makes uh, the Fisk Guide a little different? Well, I think two things. First of all, it's, uh, it's a journalistic effort. Yeah, yeah, I'm a journalist. And what you basically do is you go out and you interview people at the school about the, what their programs are, and you interview and you get questionnaires is how we use do it. Or, or sometimes I, I visit the schools as well. Or we get uh, we talk to the students and say, you know, what's it like being your, uh, at your school? And we uh, write down what they say. And so and it's basically a reporting job and we continue to update it every year because the, the colleges uh, continue to, to change. Uh, so in the first half, it's journalistic. But the other thing is, and I think this differs from other college guides, we really try to capture the institutional personality, the institutional character of, of the schools. And, Schools do have their institutional personalities, which are li linked to their history uh, and also just a whole lot of cultural factors. And school, even schools that look the same uh, really are very different. And so what we try to do in, the, in these essays and their narrative essays and coherent literary essays about each school, we really try to capture this unique institutional personality. And I think we do. So Ted, when when uh, we have a we have a room full of of, of hundreds of a couple hundred uh, counselors here, um, and um, and some other guests as well. Uh, but when you talk to counselors, um, what do they tell you that they that they uh, that the, that the first thing that they use the guide for is? Well, I think most everybody will say uh, at the very beginning of the college search, having having the FIS guide is is a useful tool because 
we cover 325 uh, colleges and universities, and there are you know, 2,200 or so in the country. In the country, so we can't really uh, cover cover them all. But it's a way of giving people kind of an overview of what of what the landscape is for the college search. And in order to help people with this, we have at the end of each write up is what we call the overlaps. Coll you know, colleges, as every counselor knows, they compete in niches and against maybe there may be six or eight other schools that have share a lot of their common characteristics and that they compete with. So if you find, uh, I say, encourage people, you know, find a school that you really like uh, and, or that you know, and then look at its overlaps because the chances are uh, based on the experience of thousands of previous college applicants, uh, you're going to find if you like one school, chances are you might like like another. And then maybe look at the overlaps of the overlaps. And by then you've got a list of probably 15 or 20 schools that would, would seem to be reasonable possibilities. And so that's just a way of getting the whole process started. And, and, which, and it can be awfully awesome, as every counselor knows, it can be overwhelming for a college, you know, looking how do I, in the world do I pick among these 2,200 schools? Well, it, just looking at finding one you like, looking at the overlaps, looking at the overlaps of the overlap, and, and you're off to the races. So you also have, uh, have uh, this thing in, in the book, uh, the college admissions pledges. Tell us about uh, the pledges that, uh, that are in there. Oh, that's just a way of um, having some fun. The, uh, <laughs> I mean, this can be a pretty, as everybody knows, this can be a college, it can be a pretty anxiety provoking experience. And it's really important, especially in the middle of it, you know, in the early, in the winter months, say, it's really important to try to keep some perspective. And, and Harlan and Ethan have done such a good job of, of helping, hel helping applicants and counselors uh, deal with all of this anxiety. But one of the things that we have at the, at the end of the, of the book, I don't know how often it gets noticed, but we have two pledges, one pledge for students and one pledge for parents. And the one for students begins, I have accepted the fact that my parents are clueless. I am serene. <laughs> and the one for the parents begins, I am resigned to the fact that my child's college search will end in disaster. I am serene. And then it goes on. And it's, it's, it's a way of perhaps uh, introducing a little humor and uh, relieving some of the tension. It's, it. there, it's there for the fun. Levity uh, amidst the pressure. Is, yeah, college hunting should be fun. You know, colleges are interesting places. They're full of lots of interesting people doing interesting things. Uh, and uh, in a way, it's the beginning of your college education. So uh, you know, it ought to be seen that way. Uh, and it's also the course can be a real lesson in the adult decision making. I mean, this is probably the first time in most teenagers' lives that they're going to be actually making an adult decision. So parents, if if they see it in this terms and follow a lot of the wisdom that Harlan and Ethan have been talking about, you can turn this into a into a creative learning experience. So <laughs> we, uh, we we've all of us have been dealing with a, a different world over the past year and a half. Um, how did uh, the pandemic impact uh, the production and the content of the, of the new edition, uh, uh, the 2022 edition, and I guess the forthcoming 2023 edition of the Fisk Guide? Well, you know, it's, it's probably a, a lot less impact than you might expect because go back to what I said before, the, uh, the, 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 we're, what we're interested in is the institutional personality and the institutional character of the school and trying to show its unique, yeah, its unique qualities. And these aren't going to change. These take years to evolve. And so my, our assumption is, and knock on wood, I think this is a valid one, it's certainly reasonable, that once all of the chaos and the uncertainty and the storm and drag of the, <laughs> of the pandemic is passed, the, these these fundamental institutional personalities are going to reassert themselves, and so I'm not getting hung up on short-term things like mass policies and all that. I mean, we're still sticking to say with what. How does the narrative describe the institutional personality of, 
of the schools. I have a, it was a really we got a, a good example of this with, with the very first edition of the of the Fisk Guide, then the New York Times Guide. And we were looking through the questionnaires from students at Penn, University of Pennsylvania. And there was an undercurrent of what you might call anti-intellectualism that ran through it. And I couldn't understand what is this doing? Why are we picking up these, these tones from the uh, from uh, students in an Ivy League school? So I put the write-up aside and I started doing some interviewing and questioning. And what I came to realize was that Penn is still reflecting the views of Benjamin Franklin, its founder. That, that Benjamin Franklin was an intellectual, you know, ambassador to Paris and all that, but he was also a, uh, a pragmatic and he, 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 he loved knowledge, but he also thought of knowledge for its, for its own sake. And then, and over the years, Penn has made its unique mark. And let's talk about its institutional personality in, in practical things. The first psychological clinic, dental school, the Wharton School. It was a pioneer in, in uh, service learning and service, service research. So it's always been a place where, where intellectual ideas were grounded in, in practical things. So if you if you think of this as and and actually the liberal arts in at Penn, I didn't realize that even though I grew up in Philadelphia, the liberal arts at Penn is really pretty much in, in its strength a post World War II phenomena. Uh, and so if you look at the history of this, you can understand uh, how it, this this fast this concept of, of the relation between. Uh, between truth and, and ideas and practical action uh, has has permeated its institutional personality. And so um, it was just a good example of this. Uh, and But the idea that this theme would show up unexpected, you know, surprisingly, in the open-ended comments of students <laughs> in the late 19th century reflecting the values of some guy who died 200 years before is remarkable, but understandable. So That's one of the things that makes American higher education so fascinating. So Ted, uh, I wanna wrap up with the elephant in the room. Uh, the elephant in the room being, uh, being test, uh, test scores, standardized test scores and test ranges. The FISC guide uh, eliminated test ranges last year. Tell us about why you, dis why you made that decision. Yeah, we had long conversations with it. We have a group of counselor advisors, some of whom may be listening today um, about, about this, about the, 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 whether it's proper to give test, to publish test score ranges. And we decided, no, it's no longer possible to do it. So the new edition of the FISC guide does not include uh, test score ranges for the various schools. And the simple reason is that they're inaccurate, misleading, and even dangerous. And as a journalist, uh, I have a congenital aversion to printing, having false information go out under my byline. So I it just couldn't, it no longer, could no longer in good conscience uh, print misleading data. Uh, now, of course, this was related to the pandemic in one sense, and that is that the COVID forced the closing of thousands of SAT and ACT testing service centers. So it was uh, a lot of students simply didn't have access to the test. Colleges stopped, but some of two thirds of colleges no, no longer require the test. Uh, and so if you have a uh, if the only, if you have only a fraction of people of student of applicants applying for uh, uh, su submitting tests, and these are the ones who happen to have good scores and have the resources to maybe travel to another state to take the test, uh, you're not going to get any valid information. Uh, and so, um, just for for that reason, but there are other uh, you know, broader, more long term considerations that, that we wrestled with. And it took us a long time to come to the conclusion. I mean, it, the argument used to be that the SAT was a way of discovering those diamonds in the rough, you know, students who, who might not have the privilege of, uh, of, of good counseling or uh, being in high schools and counselors that, uh, that admissions people uh, visited. Uh, and it was a way of what could get a good score. This was a way of spotting them. 
but that that advantage has long since disappeared for you know with some occasional exceptions of course uh, because of the testing uh, of the test prep movement and so it, it's it's just that argument just no longer holds so it's really hard to think of a good way to justify the use of the test scores and uh, as i said my counselors went along with this uh, and it, the, the the testing really uh, reinforces a lot of the ways in which college admissions officers are biased against first generation and, min and min minority students. I mean, it practices like early decision and the emphasis on leg legacies and niche sports like crew and lacrosse and, and early decision, as I said. Uh, and so basically, the SAT scores track pretty closely with socioeconomic data. And they may say more about your zip code than about your academic ability. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, well, uh, uh, Ted, thank you for your, uh, for your time here. And I think uh, Liz Kelch is going to help take us into the breakout rooms. You got it. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you to Ted, Ethan, and Harlan um, and my Sourcebooks colleagues. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I know there were some questions in the chat and we're excited to end this portion of the webinar and move on to the breakout rooms where you can ask Harlan, Ethan, and Ted uh, your questions and, and chat with them. So um, here's how it's going to work. Uh, we actually have to move to another Zoom link. So uh, we're dropping it in the chat right now. Um, you're going to go ahead and click on that. And then you're going to be put in a virtual waiting room for just a few minutes while we get everything set up. And then you will have the choice of joining Ted, Ethan, or Harlan. Um, you can hop around if you want to. Um, my colleague, Caitlin, will be in the virtual waiting room if you do have uh, any trouble or get virtually lost. Uh, she'll help you find uh, where you need to go. And our breakout rooms will be going until 3.15 p.m. Eastern time. So um, thank you again. If you're, if you're hopping off here, thank you for joining us. Um, otherwise, go ahead and click on that link and we'll see you in a few minutes in the breakout rooms. Thanks everyone. Hey everyone, I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to click that breakout room link. Um, so I'm just gonna stay here for just a few more seconds to make sure everyone that wants to join us there is able to, and then I'm gonna go ahead and end the webinar. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, Ted, if you wanted to go ahead and click that, do you see the link in the chat for the breakout rooms? If you click that one and leave this meeting, you should be uh, headed to the right place. Chat. Um... Oh, here, I'll post it one more time in the chat. And we don't haven't started the meeting yet, so um, it won't. It'll put you in a waiting room um, until we have a chance to start that meeting. But yeah, you, you will have to leave this meeting.